Um, so, first of all, I'd say thank you for having me. And Nick, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, and um, I'm really, actually, really thrilled to be here. Now, I'd like to know a little bit about you. Uh, just, just hands up. Who is training with Animas right now? Okay, so just about everybody. And so who is, who has clients? Just about, clients? Who, who's working with clients right now? Okay. And is anybody working full time as a coach? Okay. Yes. <laughs> and is there anybody here that's in, that is wanting to be a coach but is not training yet? Okay, brilliant. Okay, and then is there anybody else that hasn't put up their hand? <laughs> well, just in case, I want to know why you're here. So, um, cause I, I think this is, a, we're talking about responsibility, a personal responsibility this evening. And this is a, a big sort of passion of mine. And we're going to go through the difference between responsibility and personal responsibility. But I think it's a real responsibility of mine as a speaker, as a coach, to find out, first of all, who I'm speaking to. And, and this, is, this is the fundamentals of coaching. Who are we present with? Who are we working with? Because that is our responsibility. So, that's the first thing. So, anyhow, I'm gonna go a little bit through my story. And it's not to sort of glorify myself or to say that I'm doing things the right way because I certainly am not. I mean, I haven't done it the right way. There's different ways to do things for everybody. But I'm going through my story as a sort of um, an illustration of a client, as it were, or of someone else that went through a journey of personal responsibility. So to give it a framework. Um, first, I'm going to do that. Then we're going to go into a few excerpts, talking a little bit of differentiating between responsibility and personal responsibility. Then we're going to go through some exercises, and I'm going to ask for feedback. And then at the end, I would really like, and it won't be at the end, it'll be a good time before the end, because I, we're coaches. This is a collaborative process, that by the very nature of coaching, it's collaboration with our clients. And so this is, what, this is the way we learn is to collaborate with each other. So I would really love people to ask questions or have um, scenarios of clients. Everything we say in this room, again, as coaches, is confidential. Everybody agree to that? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, okay. And, and also the other thing is, is the no judgment. No judgment for your fellow coaches and no judgment for any clients. And so we're in a supportive environment because that's just, that's the fundamentals of coaching. And this is why I do this work, because I, I just appreciate this environment. So, having said that, I will go through, we'll go through some exercises, but then at the end, I'd like you to come up with scenarios of your clients. So if you've got anything you're struggling with or you want to share, I think we could all use that as a group. We won't let it go on forever, but I think we can get some really good learning from that. So whilst we're here, for the next 45 minutes or so, think about some things you want to share with the group or share with me or ask. Because I'm going to tell you a little bit about my background um, now, so you get an idea of where we are. So, my name is Priya Rana Kapoor, and I grew up in the UK, but went to university in the US, well, here and the US. I did my undergraduate degree in theatre and my graduate degree in counselling psychology. So my background is definitely psych. And I know that Animas is a real psych prevalent programme which is really interesting, and I was telling Sarah and Marcus about this in the States, because I did my credentials at uh, Coach U, and I did it in the, in, that, in the fast track program, so it wasn't over the phone. I think you guys have really done the right thing by doing your coaching program face-to-face um, -face with people, because I mean, you get the interaction, and you get mixed knowledge. It is really the best way to go, because you're going to be working with people face-to-face -face or over the phone, but it's still an interaction. So. So I did it that way in, uh, in America. And my graduate degree in counseling psychology. So I worked a lot in the hospital setting. So I'm neuropsych and gerontology, so that's working with older adults, and um, Parkinson's epilepsy and stroke. So I was in the hospital setting, and that was incredibly rewarding, but tough, tough. And really, <coughs> so in the States, you are either a therapist or you're a coach. And there's no mingling of the two. They will not let that happen. You are so regulated as a therapist. I had to do 3,000 hours of free training, working with clients for 3,000 hours to get my coaching, to get my therapy credentialing. 
Um, and I must say, I didn't finish it. I, I stopped early and came here, thinking that I couldn't become a therapist here. So I, that's why I took on the coaching. And I'm a much more um, directive focused therapist. I like something to happen at the end. I like success. And that's not for me, that's for the client. There is no point in me doing the work I do if my clients don't get to where they want to be. Now what I think is successful may not be what they think. And so it's meeting the client where they are. And I feel really strongly about this. And so that comes into the personal responsibility. They are responsible. We are responsible for our own success and what that means. And so we're responsible to find out what the client's success means to them. So that was a big part of why I moved away from core therapy into coaching, because I liked the, dy the, the dynamic nature. But what I found in this country is a lot of people don't like going to therapists. <laughs> they won't. I have doctors that refer people because they know I can triage the, the psychopathology. You know, I've had people come in, they say, oh, he needs coaching. He comes in, he's clearly a paranoid schizophrenic. And I'm like, yeah, no. No, I'm sending that out. But, but I could see it. And so we'll talk a little bit about that later, of what happens when um, you get someone that you think, ooh, not sure this is within my field of expertise or responsibility. So, um, so then I started coaching here, and I've had such a great time. Amazing people, and I now work primarily with men, which is not um, something that happens a lot in coaching, um, but I work primarily with men, mostly in finance. So, and, but, Working with all these people about two years ago, I started to see these are very successful people, or, you know, theoretically, they've, been, they've made quite a bit of money, and they have the 2.2 children, and the two cars in the garage, and they're supposed to be happy, but they're not. They're not. Something's missing. So I started to see that these people were really living their lives for everybody else. And... They, even though they had everything they were supposed to want to have, they didn't have their fundamental life. And so that's when I started to see this as a pattern. And I thought, you know what? I'm gonna write a book about this. And someone said to me, because I really didn't, I knew I wanted to write on empowerment um, and to get people where they wanted to be. And someone said, I said, I don't really know what the crux is. And they said, well, what's the one thing that stops people from empowering themselves. And I said, they don't give themselves permission. Now, that's a very controversial little statement because I have said to my clients, well, you know, you're not really giving yourself permission. Like, but why would I do that? Of course I am. So it gets people's backs up. So and when I say to people, give yourself permission, that is not a criticism. Mm. That is an invitation. So, I feel strongly about this, but giving people themselves, giving themselves permission is personal responsibility. So, that, that is a little bit about myself on the academic side. But what happened in the background is that I lived a ideal, idyllic, uh, good-looking life, I, you know, my, we traveled around the world, my father was a diplomat, we lived in a big house in the middle of London, and I, I, I no boo-hoo story here, but there were some difficulties. Uh, <laughs> there were some difficulties, and I actually lived my whole life worried about what other people thought of me. To the point that I was just saying that they looked at my business card, Sarah looked at my business card and said, oh, it's got sparkles on it. Yeah, I didn't let myself wear sparkles. I'm 44 years old. I didn't let myself wear sparkles until five years ago. I wouldn't let myself wear hearts or anything pink because it wasn't right for a girl of my socioeconomic background or my education. It was frivolous. And somewhere down the line, way back somewhere, I had taken that to be the truth that I was supposed to be serious and that no one would take me seriously, no one would like me if I was a frivolous girly. And, you know, there are variations on that. I don't think I'm a complete frivolous girly, but, you know, I'm enjoying life now because I've decided what is authentic to me. But growing up, I worried so much, so much 
about what other people thought of me, specifically my mother. And I think that happens a lot with the clients that I work with and a lot of people, we worry so much about what our parents will think of us. And so we go into schools, we go into degrees, we go into, uh, into jobs that are right for our families. And then sometimes we rebel against it altogether, which is the other way of working through things. So that's where I was. And um, it got to the point I, where the, my wedding, I did everything for everybody else. I read the manual about etiquette. Now, will people like this had to have engraved stationery, blah, 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 you know, thousands of pounds later, whatever. Ridiculous. What was there for me? So the next day, I went to Egypt on my honeymoon, and we arrived in, in Cairo, and we arrived the day in 97 when they massacred all the people in the tourists in Luxor. And so we went to bed that night, and we woke up the next day. Everybody had left. There was just us and the US Marines left in the hotel. The British had sent a plane. The Swiss had sent a plane. Everybody, because they massacred 98 tourists in one foul swoop. And so everybody left but us. And so I called the American Embassy because I, uh, my mother's American, so we, I was living in California at that time. And I said, what do I do? And they said, oh, just don't travel. I said, what am I going to do in Egypt for this long and not travel? I did. I went on. Next day I woke up and my hand was numb. And I thought, okay, well, I've just slept on it funny. And then as we went through the, the, the trip, my whole left side went numb. And it got to the point where I couldn't hold my head up. I couldn't really stand, I couldn't really walk, and so we took an emergency flight back to the US. Well, actually not emergency, it was one of the last flights because they had shut down the whole infrastructure in Egypt. And I arrived back in the US, went to the hospital on the day before Thanksgiving, and if you, anybody knows about Thanksgiving in America, no one wants to work. So I sat there really worried because I thought everybody was mad at me because I upset their vacation. So had some MRIs and had some things, and they said, well, good news, bad news. Um, you have uh, something in the brain, but it's not a tumor. Ah, yes, oh, uh, yeah, okay. So long and the short of it, it's, I, um, I was diagnosed two years later with MS. So that was a shock, but the more reading I did into MS, and the more I understood, a lot of it has to do, well, I figured out, for me, and I'm only saying all of this as my experience and to share it, because all I ever really want is for people to have awareness for themselves and to explore themselves. And I think when someone shares their story, other people are more willing to be vulnerable and share theirs. So um, even though with clients, I may not tell them everything, but now every client will know everything in the book. So, <laughs> um, but, um, so, yeah, I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, and I realized at that point, well, after some reading, that I had lived my life for everybody else, and that had made me sick. Because here I am 20 years later, and I'm not saying this is everybody's reality, but I have worked very hard on taking personal responsibility for my life. And that means being responsible for everything I think, everything I feel, and everything I do, down to everything I say to people and exactly how I react to people. So this got further sort of solidified when I was working with a healer in California. And uh, I was saying something, because my, my husband and I ultimately uh, broke up. We ultimately got divorced. And I think that had a lot to do with my people pleasing. I wanted to please everybody. And um, because of that, I may, you know, I, I did, I just wanted to please everybody, but I lost myself. And so all of a sudden, when you start finding yourself, things change. The people, you change to the people around you and everything gets all thrown up and, and it, it is painful. But it is the best thing I ever did, was start to make these changes, start to take personal responsibility for everything. So I worked with this healer and the healer said, you know, I was saying, oh, I can't believe it, I'm so upset. My husband won't do this, and he promised he would do that and during the divorce and everything. Yeah. And she said, he doesn't know you anything. I said, well, yes, he does. He signed a piece of paper, and he absolutely does. He should be paying you this. No, Priya. He's another human being in this world. And he could, God forbid, 
<laughs> God forbid he could die tomorrow and then he'll never be able to give you anything that he said he was going to give you. And at that point I thought, that's true. We are all human beings and we are only responsible for ourselves. Meaning, yes, we have responsibilities in life. We do, we have family, friends, but it's how we go about going into those responsibilities. And when we have those responsibilities of family, how can we make that a part of our own personal responsibility? So that means doing things that we like to do because we want to, because it fills our soul to help our family, you know, and not being resentful about it. Finding ways. And th that way of finding ways is personal responsibility because we are responsible for everything we think, feel, and do. And that's what this book is all about. If you go onto Amazon and look for a book that says, uh, how I, ne you know, I need to be personally responsible or how to be personally responsible, you ain't going to find any book. It's, it's a dirty, this is why I call this the dirty word. The dirty world, and it's a dirty word. Um, the dirty world of personal responsibility because people don't like to hear it, especially clients. Because clients are coming in because they're in pain and they're stuck and they don't know which way to go and they think that you're going to tell them. And you know, we don't. What we give them is tools to be personally responsible and find out for themselves what they need to change. But that's a really hard pill in the beginning because they've spent a lot of their life blaming other people for one reason or another. It's, it's, it comes down through family. It comes, it's certainly in society, certainly all over the news. We've become a blame culture. So, and I'm not, I'm just saying that there's no one at fault on that. So I just want to read you a little bit of an excerpt that will get kind of, in my glasses, get the, my head around, um, get your head around about what I feel personal responsibility is. Um, and then, we're going to go into what everybody else feels about personal responsibility. This is not the gospel. This is just what I have to share. Okay. The role of personal responsibility. Man is condemned to be free because once thrown into the world, he is responsible for everything he does. Jean-Paul Sartre. All too often, we blame others for why our lives have not turned out the way we would have wanted it to. Yes, others may have said or done something hurtful, rude, or even abusive, but we are the only ones who can control how that makes us feel, how it limits us, and how we allow these words or actions to dictate the rest of our lives. Taking personal responsibility can often be difficult and painful as it requires us to take a long, hard look at ourselves. This in no way means taking the blame for everything, but it does mean admitting our role in a situation or an issue. Like it or not, we are in charge of everything we feel, think, and do. We are responsible for how we interact with others, how we, what we say, and the decisions we make for our lives. Recognizing this, is called taking personal responsibility. And unfortunately, it can sometimes be a hard pill to swallow. So that's just my thoughts about personal responsibility. And now I just, so what I want to do just really quickly is distinguish between responsibility and personal responsibility. Because what I notice is that Nick um, put, I had called it the dirty world of personal responsibility and then I saw with some of his it was responsibility and and he has talked a lot to me about people blaming themselves too much so that's the taking too much responsibility on oh I shouldn't have done it this way I should have done it that way so let's I wanted to hash that out just a little bit so we we were in two different sort of camps as it were because I'm really about the, the the personal responsibility and both. So when I say the word responsibility, just responsibility, what does everybody respond? I'm not very good at this, and the pens aren't great either. So, but when I say that word, what, what comes to mind? 
Anybody? Yes. Being a parent, being responsible for your kids. Okay. Okay. Parenting. Anybody else? Ownership. Ownership. Great. Sorry, I'm not. <laughs> that doesn't work, does it? Okay. Yes. Sometimes the first thing that comes to mind is a chore. Chore. Yeah. A hassle. Hassle. Fantastic. Oh, there we go. And I'm not a great speller either. Uh, okay. Anybody else? Yes. Choice. Choice. Stress. <laughs> Thank you for being honest. <laughs> yes, yeah, guilt. Yeah. Sadness. Hmm, okay. What do you mean by that? Um, for me personally, what's just coming up with those things that when, when you take responsibility or you accept the reality of the situation, it, I get sad at the fact that I've let that happen. Okay. It's because typically if you take responsibility and, and you don't have to address it, well then everything's going okay. You face the reality of the matter and you realise, okay, I've let this go. Okay. That, that saddens me that I personally have allowed that happen in my life. Okay, so that's interesting. Because that, that kind of goes with, so, so often, and there's one other chapter, one other paragraph I was going to talk about, but with clients, it's that, and I, and I mean this in the nicest way, I don't mean this in a bad way, but I'm just trying to illustrate a point. It's that victim mentality that happens, and sometimes clients will hold on to things in the past, and that's their identity. I, and Am I getting the wrong end of the stick with this? Or But, but sometimes people I, hold I, on to things. Yeah, I understand where you're coming from there, but for, for um, it's, it's, it's not, uh, it's just nothing to do with anybody else. Okay. I just get a little sad, I'm like, oh, it's sad that it went that far. No, no regret, just sad. Okay. <laughs> okay. That's, and so, but what, yeah, and so as an aside is sometimes, and some, that, not to do with you, then it, clients will hold on to things. I mean, I know I did. For instance, when I was diagnosed with MS, ha ha, I saw that as my opportunity to say no to everything and everybody. <laughs> All of a sudden, I had my boundaries laid out. Yes, I could say no to everything, but the only way I could have freedom, take personal responsibility and have freedom, was to blame the MS. And in the long run, I was holding on to something that was insidious and painful and fearful. So, and I'm, yeah, I'm just saying as an aside, that's, what, that's where you can start with clients on working with per personal responsibility, is see where they're holding on to things because it gives, and this is a psych term, the secondary game. They're getting something. I was holding on to my disease because it, everybody let me do whatever I wanted to do. <laughs> I never had that in my life. Yay, my mother didn't upset me. You know, she didn't want anything from me. No one wanted anything from me. They're like, oh yeah, poor Priya. Let's just let her do what she wants to do. Yay. But it, it only worked as long as I had MS. It was only worked as long as I couldn't feed myself. <laughs> and I didn't want that to go on forever. So it's letting go of that. So, okay, sadness. Um, what else? Control. Sorry? Control. Control? Control. What do you mean by control? Well, if you take the responsibility because there's controlling things. So You're controlling things. Yeah. 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 And so that leads me to my next point, which we'll go into in a minute. Okay. So let's take a look at personal. Does anybody else have anything more here? Personal leadership. Leadership. Yeah. I like that. I like that. Ability. Sorry? Ability. Ability. Okay. Do as fast as possible. Okay. So this is a really good sort of look at what and some of these are positive ones and some of these well some of these are empowering. That's positive, negative, that no. Let's it's, you know, this one here with the parenting, I absolutely, I think that's a big job. You are responsible for your children when you make the decision to have them. Mm 
and you know, <laughs> and that's the only time when someone else I think is responsible for someone else. The only, and then when the children become old enough, they have to take on their responsibility, and your responsibility as a parent is to parent them to that point, and so that they can take responsibility for themselves. Mm. Um, ownership, empowering, or draining. Yeah, to a point. Chore, draining. What's that? Hassle, draining. So look, we've got draining, draining, empowering, empowering, leadership, empowering, choice, empowering. Mm -hmm. stress. <laughs> I would say sadness is draining. Yeah. yeah. Control. Could be either. Could be both. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, and ability. Okay. So you see there's a mix. And so responsibility, I think there's a way to get to a point where all our responsibilities are empowering. And that's what will go coming from a place of personal responsibility. Because um, we get to decide how we see things. Okay. Personal responsibility. Anybody? Happiness. Freedom. <coughs> Happiness. Freedom. Sure. Sure? Yeah. <laughs> what do you mean by that? Sorry, what do you mean by sure? Um, well, same as with the previous, just that... Um, some, something you have to do, something okay. you should be doing. So it's should. Should. Oh, <laughs> dirty work. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Choice. 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 Mm -hmm. And someone said confidence. Oops. Autonomy. Oh, yeah. Nice one. Boundaries. Self respect. Boundaries, self respect. Um, authenticity. Self respect. Authenticity. Loneliness. No, okay. Hmm. Yes. What do you mean by that? Well, I'll just use the analogy you gave of basically taking out your personal responsibility, it alienated you in many regards from an awful lot of your family and your, down to your, your husband. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's lonely mm -hmm. when you face that reality. It is, yeah. And definitely, I will write about the pitfalls, but it's a process. And it does, and it's, it's understanding, it's having the tools to understand what they're going through too. When you change, you're, playing, you're changing the game on them. You know, <laughs> you're doing something different. And so they're not gonna know how to react. So yes, you're absolutely right. You, I definitely, I did lose friends. I was very much alone. Um, but I replaced that with some amazing experiences and some amazing people that are right online. And I can be authentic. I don't have to hide. I don't have to be anybody else. Um, and all of a sudden, the people that are with you come into your life. The people that understand you. So it, it, it's, and this is as coaches, this is what you're going to be walking beside your clients as they do. As they do this work. It's going to be scary for them. It's going to be lonely for them. At some points you might be their only confidant. And so that takes on a whole other sort of stress as it were. But, you know, and someone was saying something about having a client they weren't sure whether they could work with because they were really worried that it was outside of their um, expertise. Now, I understand that, and I think we have to go into that, we'll go into that in a minute. But sometimes, you just need to be the person there listening. And being empathetic. You don't have to change anything. And so that 
is putting them into their space. Not putting them, allowing them to be in their space of happiness, their space of freedom. Not their space of choice, hopefully, <laughs> but their space of choice, confidence, autonomy, boundaries even, self-respect, authenticity, and maybe out of the loneliness. But so do we see here, anybody else? Any others? Peace. 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 So there's no more space on this, but see how that was easier? <laughs> so the key is, and we're going to look into this, is how to bridge the gap between responsibility, <laughs> which wasn't so fun, and personal responsibility. I think everybody's got, I mean, do, do, we, do you get a lot of classes on personal responsibility in the Animas program? And, hmm. Is it talked about a lot? I think it's probably... Implied. Um, okay. I think. Anyone else? Can you give us a definition of the two? Okay. So personal responsibility. Okay. Um, I say personal responsibility is completely to do with how we think, how we feel, everything. If someone's been horrible to us, we get to decide how we're going to react to that. So, and if someone's been abusive in the past, and there have been horrendous things that happen. And, you know, you, you see these people that were locked away for 15 years in a dungeon and, and, and by their father, and you think, oh my God, how is that person, excuse me, how is that person, I mean, it really upsets me to see that, because how is that person going to survive? But some of these people do, many, find ways to survive, because they've taken personal responsibility for their life. They're not going to be victimized twice. They're not going to let that get to them. And so I could say all sorts of things about the MS, you know, if I had done this differently, if I had done that differently. Well, it doesn't matter. What matters is how I move forward from here. Responsibility, I think that's when you take responsibility for something that isn't your doing. It's not your business. <laughs> and I mean that in the nicest possible way. So this is, I think this will be a good segue and then I'll come back and I'm going to go into control. Um, so this is the thing. We're going to come back to this, but because I want to go into control because we've had control here and um, if, so you all know the locus, of, well most of you probably know the locus of control, so the circles, yes, no, okay. Me, what I can control, what I can influence, and what I cannot control. Okay. So this is in the book, but this is a tool I work with clients that have like anxiety, depression, not, not pathological anxiety and depression, but have a little bit of stuff getting in their way. This works well with anxiety and it works well with personal responsibility because all of a sudden, before you know it, you get a chart here of trying to figure out what you are responsible for. So we were talking about, that lady over there was talking about that, you know, I'm like, it's none of your business. So in a scenario where you have your sister being absolutely one big pain in the neck, you know, and, and throwing her weight around and trying to get all the mummies or daddies, whatever, you know, uh, interest and anyhow. So going through that, it's driving you crazy. But she's not going to change. No matter how hard you've tried to make a change in 20 years, she's not going to because of one reason or another, and that's for her and her therapist. So, <laughs> you know, whatever. Um, but how does it affect you? You get to choose. So in that situation, what would you have control? I mean, it's a very basic situation, but we all, you know, have... So what... The here you are, what can you control? How you react to your sister's behaviour. Mm -hmm. 
But you can, if, if you can, if you can up and move, <laughs> great. <laughs> Although that may not help it in the long run, but yes, I see what you're saying. So, what else can you control? Your Sorry? Your own behavior. Yeah. <clears throat> own behavior. Okay. What can you not control? Uh, her. Uh, her behavior, yeah. And your mum's reaction. Right. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Yeah, no one's going to be able to read this. Sorry. Um, okay, what mm -hmm. else can you not control? Yeah, I can. Right. <laughs> That's interesting though, That's a double-edged sword. You can't control the outcome, you're absolutely right. So then we get into this area of influence, which I think is all about how personal responsibility overlays onto responsibility. Because I think if we have, well, we're going to go into values in a minute, but if we have the value that family is a value of ours, that we want to support our family, um, then we don't want to just walk away from her, but we want to try and influence the situation because we're responsible for our family and we care about our family. So we've got this, does that, and we'll get there in a minute. So the influence, what can you influence in the situation? Your feelings of guilt. Sorry? Your feelings of guilt. Oh, that's control, isn't it? That would be control. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so now that we're here, the guilt. <laughs> now that we're here in guilt, um, I'm just going to read another passage, and this is just the definition of guilt. So one day I had all these clients that were guilty, really successful, but that were guilty um, about not doing exactly what their families wanted them to do. So I said, you know what? Because I'm a funny, weird sort of uh, vocabulary person. So I said, let's look it up in the dictionary. And so this is what came up. Um, according to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, guilt. One, the fact of having committed a breach of conduct, especially violating and involving a penalty, broadly guilty conduct. Two, A, the state of one who has committed an offense, especially consciously. Feelings of culpability, especially for imagined offenses or from a sense of inadequacy. I mean, that's, that's pretty powerful when you actually look at the word guilt. It means that you've done something that you did, A, on purpose, slightly with malition, maliciousness, I mean, um, and offenses or from a sense of inadequacy. So you don't think you're good enough. And guilt comes in when we don't take personal responsibility for our lives and we don't feel that we matter enough or that we're good enough the first, I mean, this whole book is about uh, personal responsibility, but the first chapter is give yourself permission to know you matter. So, I'm going to come back to that in a minute. I just wanted to finish this. Um, so, what else can we influence? But see, this is the seed the, with the guilt. It's reframing that. So, you have control over your guilt yeah. because it's a perceived mm -hmm. notion. I, that, yeah. I mean, it's an insidious, insidious one. And it's one that a lot of people feel and a lot of people make you feel because it will control you. They can put you in that guilt box, oh, we'll make her feel guilty, and then she'll do what we want her to do next time. Yeah, but you could stop that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Makes sense. Go on, you know you were going to say? Oh, I thought you put your hand on no. <laughs> um, Influence. Can you influence the outcome? You can't yes. control it. But you can influence it. How would you influence the outcome here? The way you communicate or react or... Communicate. Exactly. What else? Decisions you make. The decisions you make, yes. And decisions you make for yourself. Right. And not because you think she'll calm down if you do something that she'll like. You do it because it's something that'll help you. So it's a slight shift, and that's the shift between responsibility and personal responsibility. If, I mean, I'm sorry, but I know this sounds really selfish, and I don't mean it this way, um, but it's all about you. It's all about keeping yourself safe. And if it means that you have to placate your sister in a way that keeps her safe, and then you'll be safe, so be it. Does that make sense? 
Yeah. Anybody want to challenge me? Hey, listen, I, I love I, being I challenged. I don't get this at all. But, okay. So, all of those three are control. You control how you communicate, react, and decisions mm -hmm. you make. I'm, I'm just not getting the difference. You do control. Yeah, okay. So the influence with the communicate, that's how you can influence a situation. Yes, you're right. This goes into communication. You can control how you communicate, but this is how you can influence the situation. We're talking about the situation, not what you can do. So this is what you do, and then you can control your, you can influence the situation and, and it not blowing up in your face by the way you communicate, but are you being by the way you react. Are you being authentic then? If you're holding something back <clears throat> to be, uh, to, to stop a situation from going out of control, but you're not really saying how Well, you, you get to choose. Mm -hmm. What's more important to you? Is it more important to be right? Mm -hmm. Or is it more important to be calm? Now listen, some people, sometimes it's more important to be right because you're trying to get something across, but you get to choose and that's personal responsibility. Mm -hmm. So you get to choose. Um, and that's the most, we go back to this, free, free, freedom. Personal responsibility is freedom. And so it's understanding, hey, you know what? If I blow up at her, if I, you know, I have bitten my sister. I was so angry with her. <laughs> and you know, <laughs> oh, that is not good, not good. It left a mark and everybody saw it and I got in real trouble, you know. <laughs> so, but I, I, may, I didn't control myself. I didn't take personal responsibility. I just let it go. And it backfired and it made her, everybody was so, all oh, poor hero, poor hero, but she was vicious to me. But anyhow, whatever, this is my issue. Um, <laughs> so, but so, you know, now I stop and say, what do I want in this situation? I actually don't want the trouble. It's more important to me not to want the trouble. So I'm going to communicate with her and say, here, you know what? It is what it is. You're going to carry on doing this, but I'm not engaging. Okay. So for you, it's, um, it's, it's taking that personal responsibility for you and not taking responsibility for her. Right. Or my mother. Or anybody else in the family. Or who I, if I think she's being wrong to someone. Mm -hmm. I can say that. <laughs> But I get to choose how far I'm going to let that go because it might get to a point where it's just really damaging for me yeah. and it's not making a difference. Yeah. That's the thing. If you see, if you want to influence the situation by communicating in a different way, that it'll influence the situation or it'll, it'll make a difference, then that's a different communication. Does that make sense? Because mm -hmm. you will... Yeah. Yes. There's something here that um, um, is quite interesting with the, the mum's reaction. Just if this is hypothetical yeah. scenario, you've got a sister and then you've got, she's maybe doing something that's affecting the parent. Yeah. And as the sister of that person, you or whoever would be worried about how that's going to affect their own mother. Yeah. We've all probably had similar situations mm -hmm. where, you know, a sibling is doing something you think, why that's going to hurt yeah. my parent. Um, and I think that that sits across both influence and not control. So on one hand, you know, the mum is a grown up mm -hmm. and sort her own stuff out. Mm -hmm. She's reacting in a way that you can't, that you don't like, then something you can do about it. But you can influence situations as well. Yeah. You can talk to the mother and say, hey, you know, you know, my sister is doing this. I don't know. So there, I think there's, there's a very grey line in all of these. Well, you get to choose again. We go back to this choice of personal freedom. You get to choose how much you want to get involved with that. So if you want to talk to your mother and try and persuade her that your sister can do no wrong, you know, that she's doing wrong, you know, you will have experience of whether that works. You'll know. And so it's, and, and all that experience and all that pain growing up or all the pain of anything that we've been through in life gets us to the point where we make the decision to take personal responsibility for, every, for what we think, feel, do, say. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's so right do, for me right now. With, I mean, it's amazing you talked about my yeah, sister. Right? Oh. So I've had quite a lot of thoughts around that recently. Mm -hmm. And I, I've come to it because I think my uh, sister definitely takes advantage of my dad. And I'm much more, uh, I just, I know it's not going to work getting involved. It's his life, uh, yeah. it's her life, yeah. and I feel much happier just mm. you know, feeling that I can let them get on with their lives. I mean, um, and can everybody hear him? No. No, no. 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 okay. So when people are talking, can you speak up? 
So. Yes, I was just saying my, this is really topical for me with my sister and my family. My sister, I perceive her, I think she is quite a difficult character, and I think she takes advantage of my dad. Um, and that has given me anxiety and worry in the past, but I've now taken a step back from that, and I realise that they're both adults and they both have a relationship, and I can't really, I mean, I might be able to influence it a bit, but I certainly can't control it, and they're old enough to be able to deal with themselves. Um, so that's how I feel about it. And you know what? It's probably sad and painful to see that. It's a relief. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's initially, painful. Yeah, it's yeah. painful to see if I think that my dad yeah. you know, has been taken advantage of. But it's actually a relief not to take that right. burden on myself. Yeah, and that's the thing. And, and it's, it's not a perfect world. You know, it's not. It's, it's back to choice. Mm. So. There's a fundamental um, level of honesty, self-honesty yeah. self or self-truth or whatever those words are in order, with all of this personal responsibility. Mm -hmm. Because then, Explain. You, then you come back to the game otherwise. Okay. And awareness as well. You have to be very aware. You have to be very self-aware. Now, so when I listen to yours, when I listen to what you were saying, you're going to have clients like this all mm -hmm. the time. This is... <laughs> I mean, this is probably what most of my clients come in. I'm just so angry at so-and-so. I really hate how my family, you know, my sister treats my mother. Well, I mean, this is going to come up a lot. And so that is the, actually the really good place to get in to helping clients with personal responsibility. Because sometimes it's, it's a tough introduction, personal responsibility, because people go, they, you know, as we said, they spent their whole life blaming people, and, and, and it just it feels good, you know. It doesn't feel very good to turn it around and, and say, actually, what was my part in this? Which brings me. So let me just go through this. So do we get this? Yeah. yeah? Just just one thought that came to mind is this. This actually reminds me of transactional analysis a little bit. If if all the players are acting as adults, mm -hmm. this kind of makes it works, but. The challenge, I think, comes in is when you've got like a parent-child relationship. Mm -hmm. For example, and I'm sorry to, to use your example there, um, um, okay. there, but you know, your father, in that situation, maybe there's some vulnerability, and you're concerned for him as like almost like a parent, and and you know, so there's instead of it being sort of adult, adult, it, it becomes that that parent-child type yeah. of um, transaction. And I, I, the thing that came up for me around influence was. Before you said that was that if you put yourself into an adult state where in influence that that could work so I had the same sort of feeling about that okay yeah so I mean yes there are different roles we all play different roles in our family and that actually is how we communicate with each other because we we know what the roles are so we we all communicate differently with different people so that's why that's in the influence it's like what I say to Sarah is, is not necessarily the same thing I'm going to say to Marcus if I'm trying to, you know, because they're two different people. They have two different sets of values. So I have to align with their values, which we're going to go into. So, okay. So is there any questions so far? Okay. So I spoke a little bit about give yourself permission to know you matter. And I think that's really important. So I'd like to talk just a little bit about self-care. Um, and confidence and self-esteem because I think without taking care of yourself, without knowing you matter in this world and you matter just as much as everybody else, if not more, really, and I'm not saying that's to not help people, that's a whole different thing. You get to be in the place of being, knowing you matter so you can be available and healthy to help other people or do the things you want to do. So you'll find, I found this with my clients, a lot of them did not know they mattered, they put everybody else first. So how can they possibly take personal responsibility if they put themselves last or second or something? So I'd like to go through, first of all, for you to get into pairs, or just the person next to you, and tell the person next to you when you were in a situation where you didn't put yourself first. You put someone else first. Yes. Can I just ask a question? <clears throat> the clients you were just talking about, are they 
aware that they're putting in the gas tax? Is it conscious? No, like, because yes. what's, what's happened is a lot of people think they're selfish if they put themselves first. It's, but it comes down to the old adage of the oxygen mask. When you're on a plane, they say, put your oxygen mask on first so you can help others. Because the reality is, is, if you don't put yours on first, you could pass out and then your child does not know what to do when it comes down. I mean, that's grim. But so they don't understand because their whole life they've been told, don't be selfish. You know, and really that's not becoming. And really you should take care of other people first. It depends on those messages they've been given. So in the beginning, no, they, they feel it's frivolous to take care of themselves or to honor themselves. And it's, a, it's, again, a journey that will take a lot of people. But I do also feel that there are little things that each person can do to all of a sudden start to get that ball rolling that they matter. I had a client that I said, what can you do? She goes, I, what can you? I said to her, what can you do that's nice, something that's nice for yourself? She goes, well, I can't possibly do that. I mean, I've got children, I've got family, I can't do anything nice for myself. I mean, what? And I said, okay, let's try. Really little, really little. Let's try. And she, I said, what do you really like? She goes, well, I like flowers. And so she started buying herself flowers. And then she started doing it every week. And I said, how's it feeling? She goes, oh, it's really nice. And, and, and I know that sounds so simple, but it got her to a point where she started changing other things. So it's the itty bitty little things. So on that vein, since I've got there, I'd like to, I'm sure you've all worked with enough clients now to have worked with a little bit of self-care and techniques of self-healing or self-care or self-love. They all sound very airy-fairy, you know? Um, but, and I used to think they were airy-fairy, especially as a therapist. I said, self-love, self-care, what, what are you talking about? But it's the act of giving yourself cues to know that you matter. So I'd like to ask other people what they have done with clients, because honestly, I cannot tell any more people to buy themselves flowers, or to take a bath, or to have a massage. <laughs> and so, whatever. So I'd love to know what other people are working with their clients, or what other things clients have come up with for self-care. Yes? I had a client recently who surprised me, I didn't know this about it. She'd written a book, and she was really down about having written this book. It was a book launch, she didn't want to go, it had been a really difficult thing to do. I was very impressed that she'd written yeah. a book, not that many people, lots of people talk about writing a book. And she was heavy, really heavy with it. And all I did was get her to acknowledge some of, some of what it had taken for her to write that book. Okay. What had it taken of her to write that book? You know, persistence and collaboration, and, and as she talked about the things she said, she she lightened with it. She lightened? So she was acknowledging herself. That's yeah. what she hadn't been able to do. She hadn't acknowledged. Yeah, acknowledged her success. Yeah. The effort and the effort she made. Yeah. Uh, it's something I need a lot with my clients when I notice that there's a self-esteem thing going on. Mm -hmm. you know, what could you do to acknowledge yourself? Okay, that's, that's great. And, and, and one very specific tool um, that a lot of my clients end up doing is to actually, before they go to bed at night, uh, they write down at least 10 things that they're proud of. 10? Wow. So ten. And then to really take in what they've done. So to write them, they're just a brainstorm of what they are, and then to go back to it and read each one and, and breathe it in. Breathe it in. Really acknowledge themselves. And it might be as much as I actually got out of bed and had a shower this morning if somebody's really down. And so what you're doing is giving them permission <laughs> to even, and that's what our job is as a coach in the beginning is to give them permission to buy the flowers, to say I'm proud of myself for getting out of bed, depending on where they've come from. When what I say to my clients, I'm giving yourself permission, I'm giving you permission this week, maybe next week, but not much more past that, because I want you to take that mantle. So thank you for sharing that. And, and do you get, I mean, there's probably resistance in the beginning. Yeah. I yeah. Mean, you know, and it's just pushing through. <laughs> because all of a sudden when they get it, it's just like, oh, okay, I matter. And then it's a domino effect into the personal responsibility and everything else that happens. So 
that's why it's the first on the, on, and it's what I have to work with. You know, and I have clients that are MDs of some of the biggest banks in London, and they don't think they matter. So, anyhow, anything else? Yes. Yes, I just want to share um, a client that I'm working with at the moment. She's Can everybody hear back there? No. Oh. Can you stand up and turn around? Do you mind? No, I don't Is know. that okay? <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> Thank you. What's your name? Uh, Amina. 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 Hey, I didn't realize there were so many people. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Okay. Yes, uh, I'm, I've got this big challenge. I'm working with. Uh, a very intelligent, very beautiful young lady. She's in her late twenties. She's got a five-year-old, and uh, her self-esteem is so, so, so low. She thinks she's the weakest person. She thinks everything that is negative. She was in a very abusive um, marriage, and at the age of twenty-four, eight months pregnant, she had the courage to walk away from that relationship. And in front of me, you know, I'm looking at a lady that is so intelligent, so strong, you know, and I said to her, can you imagine at the age of 24, eight months pregnant, you walked away from this marriage. You took that decision and she comes from a very strong culture where divorce is like a big, big, big taboo. And I'm saying to her, and you did that at 24, now you're 29 and you think you are useless, you think, you know, she, I asked her, to, she wrote um, all the negative thoughts she has for me, and uh, very, very painful, you know, to watch, and I'm struggling, you know, trying to um, make her understand how intelligent and how strong she is. She gives me an example, like, when she's at work, and uh, there's a position, and people um, suggest to her that, we think you will do very well in this position. She will say, no, no, me, no, 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 me. And uh, I'm struggling with no, it. I'm feeling a lot yeah. of pain, you know, Feeling for a her. lot of pain, no, and yes. I answer, yes. well, first of all, it's amazing that she has you there. Mm. I mean, that's the reality of our job. We're going to come across these people that have been through extraordinary circumstances. Mm. Thank, Thank you. you very much for sharing. Thank you. See, and that takes courage, A, to come up here, but it also takes courage for us to work with the people we do. And that is part of the joy of being a coach. So she's really lucky that she has you there to point these things out. So I just want to sort of reiterate that. And yes, that is our job. It is our That's one of our responsibilities as coaches, is to show people a mirror. Look at yourself. Look what you've done. Look how far you've come. And that's the main thing as a coach. You've done well, because there's probably not a lot of people that are holding up that mirror to them. And at the same time, we get to do that to ourselves once in a while. Someone asked me today, the, the drive, taxi driver here said, don't you feel sometimes completely helpless when you've got clients that have such a horrible existence or something terrible has happened to them? And I said, you know, I don't, I feel, yes, sometimes I do, especially when I was working in hospitals in neurology when you had someone with epilepsy and they couldn't even pay their rent. And, I, and, you know, and their rent wasn't much and I was worrying about shoes and what, sh if I could, you know, if I could buy these shoes or something. And I mean, you know, I felt really, really just dreadful then. But at the same time, I did my 1,500 hours for free. And I worked with people with Parkinson's, epilepsy, stroke, Alzheimer's. And I realized if I hadn't shown up that day and I hadn't studied at school, there wouldn't be anybody there for them. And I'm not trying to glorify myself again. I'm just saying that everything happens in the right time, place, and space. And you will get the clients that need you. You will know what to say at exactly that time because that's the person that was supposed to be sitting in front of you. And the sooner we understand that, the easier our jobs as coaches will become. I feel really strongly about that, that the right people come across your radar. And in the beginning, I to completely understand you want to make money. You've got to make money. And so you take clients that aren't right for you for one reason or another. And, and that, I will say, is, is a, a, something to look at in personal responsibility. 
because that will bring you down. And I understand there's a balance, but I'm just saying if you open yourself up to the place where you expect the right client to come to you, they will. And they'll hear exactly what they're supposed to hear. And I know that sounds sort of out there and not very scientific. There's a ton of science around coaching that we can learn, but we can't necessarily feel. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. All right, so anything else for self-care? Anybody else got any pearl of wisdom? Yes. Meditation. I always okay. ask clients if they meditate. Mm. Always, very early on. Very early on, yeah. meditation. And so what do you, what do you, see, I have a lot of clients that are kind of scared of meditation. Yeah. So how do you make it less scary? I simply ask them and see how they respond. And if they, it's obviously scary for them, I'll drop it right there and then. Really? But come back to it. Come back it's to it. It's planting a seed for me because I know a transformation has been personally and yeah. for other people I know. So mm -hmm. I have a strong belief in meditation. But I'm not going to force it. It's about just slowly, slowly, and see if it, see if it resonates. Something will never... Did you hear that back there? Yeah. He was talking about meditation and not pushing it, but slowly, slowly um, putting it, I mean, introducing it yeah. and incorporating it. Exactly. Yeah. So when, you, when they do, when they are open, what do, how do you explain it to them? What do you what do? You do? So I, I suggest, uh, explain, suggest the way I do it. Okay. I, I take guided meditation, which is okay. really easy yeah. when you're starting, isn't it? It's, it's really easy to do, and I'll, I'll even say that I use these ones, but you can use any ones. But I would start with that, because you get someone speaking to you, and yeah. you get different into it that way. Um, and that's what I've done with uh, two or three clients recently. And they've gone with it, and it's, work, they're much working for them working right now. Mm -hmm. Now, do you do the meditation? Would you do the guided day? You, you get them, do you no. have a cadre of... of Meditation, so, guided so meditations that I, you use? So I send them to Deepak and Oprah. Okay. That's what yeah. I do, because that's what I use. Great. And for $40. Great. So that's a concrete tool that you yes. have at your yeah. disposal? Yeah. 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 And that and people love that. Yeah, <laughs> So, yeah. yeah. So, no, I would, I would totally agree with the, with, with the meditation, with the guided imagery yeah. and the guided meditation. It's a yeah. ton easier. And it's, it's, it, you get results from it quicker in the beginning. Because you go, oh, this is what it's supposed to feel like. And then you're more able to get into that space on your own, whether it's music or counting or breathing or whatever it is. So, but it does quiet the mind. And that's a key, especially in self-care. The mind is so busy now. The mind has so many phones and this and that and people and blah, blah, blah. I mean, we're all, and I was, went to the loo before I was in here, but the girls was, just talking so loud, and I was like, shush, 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 shush. But the mind needs rest. And that's taking care of your physical being when you rest the mind. So, thank you very much for it's sharing It's also that. a way to accept just what is. Mm. Yes. Uh, just accept your reality as it is, rather than the striving and the, you know, and the looking back on the past and like striving in the future. It just forces, or not forces you, but it, helps you just see reality as it is mm -hmm. in the present moment and be fine with it and just observe it. Right. Being present. Yeah. Present. And that is, and I'll say as an extension, that is our responsibility as coaches. So we're, we're coming up to this responsibility as coaches is to be present with the client. Like being present in this room. I'm so, I mean, I'm just thrilled to see everybody here and I'm, I'm happy here. I don't want to be anywhere else. And, and that's what makes life joyful, I think, is being present. Okay, anything else for self-care? Um, just going back on the meditation, I recently had a client who was going through a, a really terrible time, and um, in particular anxiety or that situation. And the technique I used was um, EFT. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that was very effective. Great. Um, with that particular situation, that she accepting what was happening to her. Yeah, and that's the key yeah. for that particular situation. Again, this is our responsibility as a coach, is to figure out what's right mm. for that person at that time in that situation. Mm. So yes, fantastic. And there was one other hand. One more? Yeah. So in my experience, uh, people who feel vulnerable or who have a victim mindset, 
really struggle to understand their own strengths mm. and to find their own strengths. And in my experience, um, what I've tended to do is to ask them to look at the existing resources within their reach. Yeah. So often, um, I work mostly with communities, so often they just struggle to see what they're capable of doing and what their capacities are. Mm -hmm. What they can see is what resources are around them. And if they start with that, it's like a circle of comfort. Kind of yes. Thing. Then you can kind of delve deeper and then look at the existing strength within them. Yeah. Uh, it's like a step by step approach. And I find that really useful. And gradually, that victim mentality starts to change and starts to become very empowering. Brilliant, thank you. And the reason I, I did this is because we're all going to come across people that don't take care of them, that don't think they matter. And I feel that, as I've already said, that that's the number one thing, the number one issue to work on to get people where they want to be. If they don't think they matter, then there's just no point. Mm. No. So that was just a few tools because I think it's really, and this is the other thing, it is a collaborative process coaching between the coachee and the, the coach and the coachee, but we also have to work with each other. So I think it's important to ask each other, what do you do in this situation? It's not a sign of weakness, it's a sign of strength because you want to help your client and that is our main, number one responsibility, is our clients and our clients' well-being. We can't make them do anything, but we can certainly try and influence and support. So, okay. Right, now we have time, we're good. Okay, so is there any questions right now? I'm quite interested in that exercise that you were going to get us to do in a minute. Okay, then the one, okay, thank you for coming back on that. I knew that was somewhere in there because I have one more exercise that I really want to get to. Okay, so now, that, let's not go into partners, but I just want, just for you to think of a time when, and, and this is sort of, it's worrying because I don't want anybody to blame themselves, but I just want to, I want people to recognize that there's a space where they did put other people first. Yeah. And, and to recognize where that was and what they did and how they could have done it differently. Not to blame themselves, not to blame yourself, and not to feel guilty. But now knowing what you know about personal responsibility and maybe wanting to take some more on or giving yourself permission to think it's all about you just in this room with these four walls, with all of us together, how would you have done that differently? At the same time as supporting or being a nice, well, nice person, no, because that means that you're giving some power away, but doing what you wanted to do. Because sometimes we want to support people. Sometimes it's more important to go with your friend to the party because she needs your support, even though you should really be at home. But you get to choose. So does that make sense? So just think, just think in your minds, just for, for a minute, and if you want to write down, um, a time when you didn't put yourself first, you put someone else first, to your detriment. To your detriment. And how you could have shifted that a little bit. So I'll give you one minute to think about that and write that down if you want to, if you've got pen and paper. Okay, did everybody come up with something? <laughs> Some people did. Does anybody want to share? I know it's pretty personal. Yeah. It links into the. Uh, you might have to stand up to the chair, everybody can hear you. Sorry. Everybody on Tim. Um, it links into the family. It's, it's kind of general and it's like long. Yeah. You know, History. It, it, yes, it expands. Yeah. And it's something that over the last what, year, maybe two years, I've sort of consciously um, worked out. Okay. Um, so, it, it links again, it's like relationship, triangle relationship between family members. So. There's different dynamics. I've got a sister, there's two parents, and there's different dynamics, but one of those is between the way that my mother and my sister communicate. Um, and it's really just, this is, I'm going to make this very general, but it is just, it's been for years, it's kind of, I've been that sort of person in between mm -hmm. all the time, obviously, but you know, a lot of the time, um, that bridges their relationship. Right. And I realized, one, it wasn't, it was detrimental detrimental to me in the long term because well they made it in any number of ways actually which won't go into but yeah. um, just in terms of well responsibility I'm not sure if I'm personal responsibility or responsibility but it is responsibility in a negative way in right. terms of because you, know, you felt the pain 
Yeah. Because there was there was something here where it felt like an obligation. Obligation. It was. It was yeah. And, and uh, not sure. It's, that's that just um, very heavy. Sorry. Yeah. So um, it was the hassle or the guilt it was stress. stress. Than, yeah, stress certainly. And, and I think just that it's quite a pattern in many ways over time. Mm. And. Um, and that, that was the detriment to me. And just now it's got to a stage where I can quite openly say to either of them, and I mean, for example, um, you know, my mum said to me a few weeks ago, um, oh, if you could just tell your sister. And we all yeah. didn't have mm -hmm. And I'm like, uh, I said, no, mum, give her a call. Or, you know, do, what, do whatever makes sense, but just, you know, you, you tell her. Yeah. Um, and I would have uh, looked at the opportunity hasn't happened in that same way, but I would send the same to my sister because it's like, really, guys, it's your relationship. And in some ways, the pain of it is still there in a way that is, I can see that their relationship isn't yet gelling or, right. you know, um, and it may not. So, go on. And it may not. And I'm very aware that, you say, for example, right. my, my sister's relationship with my dad, which is a separate dynamic, but that is almost certainly not going to get any better before he passes away. It's very unlikely. And in one way that's painful, but in another actually, that is now, it's a release, because it's what it is, it's their relationship. Yeah, so it's what, not, so... It's not mine to... It's not your... Influence, but I'm not looking to control... It's them. not your responsibility it's to control their, their, their relationship. And what is your responsibility? What is your responsibility in this situation? Um, I think my only responsibility really is to be true to me yeah. and, and true to them in, in a personal yeah. sense. They're yeah. not what they. Well, you're not neglecting the situation, no. you're taking care of yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And then you'll be a better brother and a better son mm. because of that. Yeah. And Does I that make sense? Very much, so, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Great. Is there anybody else? Go on. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> similar in a way to Tim, I was going to say most of my adult life. So this may not be that specific, but it's around, and something we didn't put up here was financial responsibility. Um, and I think if I distill it down, um, that a lot of the decisions I've made has been around responsibility financially for my immediate family. Yeah. Um, and I've started taking time now to actually change that for myself and actually follow my heart and I feel inspired by what I want to do. So I'm right in the middle of that whole process now of trying to reform, uh, almost reform sort of relationships and my, right. my feelings about responsibility yeah. to others. But that's not, that's not easy because you do have a responsibility to your family because yep. you got married. Or, yeah, yeah. or what you know, or you you went into that contract to have your children, and and I think you know the parenting contract is the most mm -hmm. responsible laden one, but there's the you know, but um so so you have to that comes down to choice with personal responsibility, yeah. you know I'm does that make I sense? Think, so yes. you get so to I think my initial choice was just to think yes, brilliant, this is fantastic, and everybody's going to love it because I love it, yeah, and that hasn't happened, no, and mm -hmm. so. Because you're changing the game on them. Yeah, completely. Yeah. Uh, and, so and you're changing their financial well being as well. Potentially. Yeah. yeah. Well, Certainly potentially all Feelings maybe. around security yeah. and uncertainty. So you've got to make that up in different, uh, you know, yeah. because that's still a family. So I'm not, uh, I don't have any answers for myself at the moment, but I'm working on it. Yeah, good. And that's the process. Yeah. That's what it's all about is working on it and seeing if it'll work. Because sometimes not everything works the way we want it to. You know, and this probably will if you've got the intention and you can figure it all out. It may not. Well, it, it may not work uh, exactly how you want it to right now, yeah. or what you think you want, mm -hmm. but it may work in a different way because something will come up, an experience will come up that will shape everything else that comes. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so we've got um, about 15 minutes to answer questions. Did anybody come up with scenarios they wanted to talk through, or questions, or anything? I'm open. <laughs> Any questions about working with clients, um, getting clients, business side of it, anything, writing, anything? Um, Go on, yes. I've got a client, and I think the 
the most difficult thing is the whole issue around procrastination mm -hmm. um, and responsibility or personal responsibility mm -hmm. around that. She fundamentally thinks that she doesn't deserve mm -hmm. what she wants and she's got this huge fear of failure mm -hmm. and by not doing these things and moving forward mm -hmm. that's the payoff for her because yeah. she's protecting herself from right. that failure. Yeah. Um, but she still really, really, really wants it and we've set all these things up and she, you know, we go through these plans together yeah. and we put in, you know, reward systems and, and all of that, things that, you know, really matter to her to reward herself with, but then actually doing it never, ever, ever happens. No. And why do you think that is? <laughs> it's the same, it's the same thing, isn't it? She still doesn't feel like she deserves You're it. Right. She doesn't feel like she matters enough yeah. for it. And there could be other things around it, and yeah. then we get into the psych realm. You know, some maybe she, maybe when she was successful, when she was little, yeah. someone bashed her down, and so, but, but yes. Yeah. I don't think there's such thing as procrastination. Uh, well, there is, of course there is, but I don't think there's such thing as lazy. Mm. It's just they're not interested. Mm. And so she's more interested in keeping herself safe mm. than taking a risk. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so it's shifting, and I'm not telling you what to do, I'm just in my experience, this is what I've come across. It's shifting that risk to a positive, because risk is always seen as a negative. Mm. And so it's shifting that risk to a positive, which I always I call the risk equation, as it were. So when you when you do something, you take a risk and you fail. You think, oh, I failed, but you haven't failed. You gained an experience mm. that will only put you in better stead the next time. Mm. Because now you've got that experience, you're going to know how to not make that same mistake twice. If you make the same mistake twice, it's a shame on you. But, you know. <laughs> so, but, but if you can understand, okay, I need to do this differently or I need to go about it differently. So it's reframing, mm. maybe. Was that what you were asking? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's but, but it's, it's really challenging. To this personal responsibility. Mm. Sorry? It's, it's linked to this personal responsibility Absolutely. as well. Um, well, and people don't want to take responsibility mm. sometimes because it is too painful. It changes the game on people. You yeah. know, and then people start saying, well, what happened to you? Aren't you being selfish? Mm. Well, to them it kind of looks that way. But the thing is, is you're going to have to live with yourself when you're 80. Mm. I mean, you know, you could kill yourself for everybody else. But, see what I'm saying? Yeah. So it is. And it's, it's very hard to get to that place with them through just questioning. I find myself wanting to... Teach. Yeah, or make suggestions and things. And, I, you know, it kind of feels like you're going round and round in circles. Cause yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can ask all you so like. So it's, it's questioning in a way that has an outcome. Yeah. What will that look like if you, you know, there's, mm. there's, there's questioning and then there's yeah. questioning. <laughs> yeah. so, um, you know, there, there is ways of saying, if, this, if you were to do this differently, mm. what would that feel like? Or how would you do that differently? And you could plant a few. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but then I, I mean that in, the, in, in a, because that is the reality. You are with these clients. Yeah. And so you do have a little bit of scope to, to look from the outside, it's that mirror again. You know, look at yourself and this is what I'm actually seeing on the outside. I see someone that's, and I mean, I'm pretty confrontational, and this is what I was gonna say, I'm fine with being challenged and everything. I can be quite confrontational with my clients, but you have to know when to be mm -hmm. confrontational. And I'll say, you're trying to hide something from me. You know, you're trying to hide it from yourself too, but it has to be at the right time, mm -hmm. and you have to gain that rapport. But the people, so sometimes that's what needs to happen. You don't have to say, this is what you're hiding. Yeah. Yeah. But you can say, there's something you're hiding. And, and what is that? Mm -hmm. Because that's what's sticking you. Don't you want to get to that place? And then you say it with a smile. And, you know? <laughs> so, does that help? Yes, it yeah. does. Thank you. There was someone else that said, yes? I was just going to make a, uh, a response around the procrastination piece. One of the things I often do is get the fears out. Basically, around what choices do they want to make? And the really important piece is to get them in 
want to help them to get into sexual assault and then why do they want those things? Why? What? So, you know, I, I keep asking that, that question. So you want that because? Yeah. And then I go, and you want that because? And the more yeah. they can get in touch with why they want something, their high intentions for something, that gives them the motivational right. fuel to move forward. Having cleared out the fear. Having cleared out the fear. Yeah. Get rid of the fear first so that then you can, you know, that's yeah. like the dirty fuel that stops them from moving forward. Exactly. You can clear that out. And that gets scary sometimes, even in, I remember in the beginning of therapy and coaching to, to look at those fears with clients, because all of a sudden you're taking on that stuff too. And so that comes just with time and being able to be okay in that space. So, it, and it's just working it through because we're all human beings and we all work together. Now, I was conscious that we've got just a, seven more minutes, yes? Imagine at the beginning that in the States there's a, a, the practice areas are very much more clearly defined yeah. between being a therapist and a life coach. So maybe um, mm -hmm. it's a little bit more blurred here. So what advice would you give to somebody who is just embarking on um, becoming a life coach, trying to be a life coach, where they come across a, a client in a situation where this person probably needs therapy, but there may be something inside them thinking that this is going to be a great experience. The, so the this coach, is like a, the this coach. Is like an ethical or a moral dilemma. Mm -hmm. So, what advice would you give? What advice to trust your gut? That would be the, the, the main thing. Um, I'm really on a bandwagon about this and coaches working, and I, I think because you're doing such a great program, you guys aren't included, but there are so many coaches out there that are working unethically. They've taken no courses, they don't understand what being present is, they don't understand what ethics are, um, and they don't understand their responsibility, which we're gonna to go to, we've got just a short amount of time. Um, they don't understand what they're supposed to do. They say, I've, the amount of people that come to me say, oh, I could do that, I give really good advice. <laughs> and you know, I almost want to, you know, I wish there was a really strong governing body for coaches. I mean, we have this governing body, but you know, so it's, it's, it's really important to know what you can handle, what you want to handle. I don't work, for instance, with eating disorders. It's not something I'm good at, it's not something I know anything about. I work a lot more with older adults or people in, in different sort of businesses. I will refer out for that one because A, I don't want to work with that. I don't think I'm going to be the best coach. So I often refer out. I get, a, I have a group of coaches that I refer to or a group of therapists that I refer to. Um, and if it's serious psychopathology, a serious depression, or if you think they're suicidal and everything, absolutely refer them out and you know, or back to their GP. It's really tricky in this country because the mental health system is so different from the United States. Um, it's not really readily available to people. And really only becomes available when, uh, how do I say this politely? Um, when the doo-doo hits the fan, you know? <laughs> I mean, seriously. Until they're practically incarcerated, especially with schizophrenia. Um, so, first of all, there would be that. So refer out when you're not comfortable, but then by the same token, don't run away afraid. Because you think, oh, I can't deal with that. Again, it goes back to that being with the person because you are the person that's there. So be with them as far as you feel comfortable and then trust your instincts. That's what I would say. Don't ever leave them. You can't leave a client high and dry. I know that is, is tricky, but that's our responsibility as a coach. You can't leave them high and dry. Refer them, get them help from their GP, or find somewhere for them to go. Always make a referral. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. So yes. Yeah, I just want to share some information. I work with mental health. Okay. Okay. Um, a charity organization called Mind. Oh, great. And a lot yeah. of people uh, are not aware of the fact that they can just walk in. They can walk into Mind. See, I didn't even know that. They can just walk in, and we do everything. Great. Whatever they need, if it's housing situation, if it's suicidal, we have contact with GPs. Uh, and where are you located? Well, there, there, there's a national uh, mine, but I'm with Hammersmith and Fulham. 
And what's the website? Uh, mind, if you just Google Mind. Mind? Yes. Okay. Mental Health. Mind. Mental Health. Yes. Okay. Yes. That's a great resource. Thank yes. you. Yes. Great. Okay, so I'm going to stop with the questions just briefly because we did, I just wanted to go over our responsibility as coaches because I think that's what we're all here for. So we've talked, we've, I keep bringing little bits up. So what do we all think our responsibility I'm not going to write this down. Let's just shout it out. What is our responsibility as a coach? Be confidential. Yep, confidentiality. Absolutely. Because they won't, there, there's no rapport if they know that we, I mean, Although, I don't know, who has um, informed consent or what I call informed consent or where you have them sign that you, everything is confidential except if you think they're a harm to themselves or others, yeah. I highly recommend doing that even though in this country it isn't uh, mandated, especially for coaching it's not, but harm to yourself or others, if you think they're a harm to children or someone they're taking care of and you can find these paperwork and I'm sure Nick has those. So to have those and have people sign them even in coaching. Yeah. What's else our responsibility? Non-judgmental. Sorry? Non-judgmental. Non yeah. non Be present. Be present. Yeah. Empathy. 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 Yes. 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 Self-reflective as a coach. Oh, yeah. Self-reflective as a coach. Yeah. God. Yeah, we don't. Yeah, definitely. Anybody else? In integrity. Yes. What do you mean by that? God, everything. <laughs> um, on your timing, your commitment, yeah. um, honoring your words, regardless, you know, just respect of them, of yeah. time. Of, um, respect of them and time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, be on time, show up, be prepared. Um, the, a lot of I think a lot of people take on coaching as uh, and, I, and again I don't think it's this group but there are people out there that take it on as a frivolous byproduct or, uh, and not frivolous but as a byproduct of what they're already doing and they don't understand the core competencies of coaching. This is an awesome responsibility, and but it's a great one, and it's fun, and it's empowering for for the client and for the coach. And it's just going to make this world a more cohesive environment. So I commend you for being part of this community. And it's always lovely to see more coaches coming through. And so my, my purpose here this evening was to speak with you and find out what's going on, have a forum for everybody to share. So carry on. I mean, do you all know each other? No? Some of us. Okay, well, you know, reach out to people. If you've heard someone talk about something or you're sitting next to someone, get their emails and, and have a community together. And, and, you know, my card's over there. You're welcome to get in touch with me because I, I just, I, 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 I hold this profession in such high regard. And I know out there people aren't. People don't sometimes. They think we're non-trained therapists. I mean, I went from therapy, neuropsychotherapy, to coaching and people are like what are you doing are you crazy i said yeah but i like coaching <laughs> i'm happy and that goes back to the personal responsibility so and i understand there's a fine line between responsibility and personal responsibility so really responsibility is the exterior things that we can control and that we or we can't control or we can influence that's the outside responsibility and personal responsibility is being responsible to ourselves because we know we matter enough mm -hmm. in life. And that is what clients need to know mm -hmm. because they're asking for help. And we're there to help them. So having said that, I wonder if we were respectful of your time. <laughs> and we are over for this evening, but thank you very, very much for being here. Thank you.